it's very easy to put DNA from one thing into another organism. That being said, I cannot put bird wings on me. It's too complicated to do it. And there's limitations to this. But a lot of the insulin that people use for themselves, guess where that comes from? They come from bacteria that is making human insulin, right? So this is more common than we like to think, of, than, than a lot of people know about. When everyone says, oh, GMOs are very, very dangerous, a lot of times they don't realize how prevalent actually this is uh, and, and how kind of safe it's been proven to be. Um, for all the very, very var uh, varieties, variety of uses that it has. So a restriction enzyme is basically an enzyme that knows to cut DNA at a certain place. And these are really important, right? We talk about this idea a lot of cutting DNA at a really specific place, especially when we're talking about CRISPR, right? Which is a, the, the really very, very hyper-specific way that we can do this. But we've had the technology to cut DNA at specific locations for quite a while. And it's really, really helpful. And I, you, it is very likely that you're going to work with restriction enzymes, and it's helpful to understand what's happening at the molecular level. So we're going to make a quick demo for how restriction enzyme sites work. So on your white strip of paper, it, can everyone grab that whole strip of paper? We're going to be making a, a, a cut uh, in this uh, using our restriction enzyme right here. So you'll have A, A, G, C, T, T. And then you're going to have T, T, C, G, A, A. And we put a line right here. And we put a line right here. And then what you're going to do is you're going to put a line right here. And that actually simulates what the restriction enzyme would cut. It's going to cut at a very specific location. It doesn't just cut anywhere on the DNA. It cuts at one of these sites, which is helpful because often we don't want the whole DNA, we just want a little section of it. Okay, beautiful. Next, we're gonna use that same restriction enzyme to cut our green DNA. Does everyone have their green DNA? Okay. And you're actually gonna be cutting, doing the same thing. However, on the green DNA, because this is our jellyfish DNA, this is kind of mod modifying this, I want to insert this into it. So I actually need to cut this at two locations. My first cut was to open my plasmid, but my second cut is to be cut out a specific gene. So I actually need to cut this twice, okay? My first one you're gonna see is right here. So if you can make the same cut that you made last time, so you're actually just gonna kind of draw this in. And you're gonna do it again at the end when you see that same restriction site. Remember, it doesn't just go to any site. It only goes to those restriction sites. And what it'll do is you can kind of insert it into each other, okay? So, very nice. That's kind of restriction enzymes in a nutshell. Okay, so with restriction enzyme, you would have cut your DNA, okay? Got it? You would have cut your DNA. And now we're gonna talk about one of the uses for once you cut DNA. Like, why would you want to cut your DNA? So, thinking through this, I have a great little animation about PCR, um, which is uh, short for polymerase chain reaction. Uh, and this is a process that is going to make, so PCR is polymerase chain reaction. So once I've cut my DNA, sometimes I want to make a bunch of copies of it. I've done this with Catherine, actually, extensively, because we do DNA barcoding. Anyone else here to do the Urban Barco project in the city? Yeah, you, you, you've done it before. So that's the, the first step is you kind of get your DNA, and then you want to cut it with restriction enzymes, and then you want to make copies of it, because you can't just analyze one little strand of DNA or, or even you know several thousand copies of it. You need to make a ton of copies of your DNA for it to be anal uh, able to be analyzed. Okay? Um, so we're going to talk through what this looks like. So the first step I want to do is I have this. This is, that little ladder is, DNA, okay? And I want to heat up DNA. When I heat up uh, things, what happens to those things? Yeah, they start to they denature, but it's part, partially, be, partially because they're just moving really quickly, right? So they move really quickly, and that causes these little hydrogen bonds that are holding them together, which are actually not that strong, uh, to separate. I mean, they're strong, but they're not so strong that they can handle like boiling temperatures, almost boiling temperatures. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to denature my DNA, okay? And uh, 
that's going to separate them for the first time, and that's at about 94 to 96 degrees centigrade, which is really hot, right? That is almost boiling. So I'm going to separate those. That is step one. So all my whole DNA strand is separated, okay? And now I turn the temperature down. This is actually what they do. Now, you, they don't, you don't actually do this on a stove. You have this very expensive device that can just do this for you automatically. We just send it in a machine and just leave it overnight. Because there's nothing to see, you just send this big kind of machine. And if you're in a lab that has a PCR machine, you often just leave it overnight because it takes a long time to have that. So next we turn the temperature down and then it's going to anneal the primers. And now the primers are things that are going to connect to certain parts of it. So I'm annealing primers for the first time. That is my next step. So I anneal my primers. Those are my little primers. Okay? And those, because it's been cooled down, they're able to attach to the DNA. Now I heat it up a little bit which is going to allow something else to happen. It's going to allow my primers to extend. It's going to allow me to make a copy of my DNA. Because in my little solution, I have these primers, I have enzymes that are able to make the copies, and I have a bunch of free nucleotides in there, right? I have a bunch of A, G, C, and T. So now I, my third step is I extend them at 72 degrees Celsius. And this is going to leave me with how many copies of my gene do I have now? Two. I have two copies of my gene. After one round, I have two. So let's go to the second cycle. Okay. The first step in the second cycle, this is my fourth step overall, is to denature the DNA. Okay. My fifth step is to anneal them. So I'm going to cool it. So I'm now the primers to anneal, so they're going to connect, and it's going to say, let's start, let's make a copy here. And then I'm going to extend the primers. I'm going to heat it up to 72, and it's going to extend them. At least temperatures are different based on the primers you're using, based on the enzymes you're using. But in general, it gets hot, cools down, gets a little hotter, and then gets hot. And you kind of see that little graph. All right, at the end of round two, how many copies do I have? Four. How many copies do you think I will have at the end of round three? It's eight, because you do two to the third power, okay? Oh, I can let you watch this. <clears throat> so I heat it, I nail the primers, and then I extend them. Okay, so I have eight copies now. How many copies will I have at the end of the four rounds? 16, good. So at the end of my fourth cycle, I'm gonna have, um, well, this way, Eventually, I'm going to have 16, and uh, then it's going to continue on, okay? So that is the basics of polymerase chain reaction. But just keeping this in mind, am I copying my entire strand of DNA? No. I'm just copying a gene. And I have different primers, and I have different enzymes based on what I want to copy there. When I work with plants, I'm going to use a very different thing than when I work with cockroaches, or if I work with... Uh, animals, I mean, it's always very, very different. And when you're in a lab, you're going to be using different things. Next, we're going to talk about gel electrophoresis. Okay? Now, many of you have done gel electrophoresis before. Okay? So, everyone, our first, our restriction enzyme, we made, a cut, we made our cut in our DNA. And then we made a bunch of copies of it. And now we want to see what those copies can tell us, right? And so, one of the tools that we use is gel electrophoresis. We have different things here, okay? These are called my what? What do I call these things? Those are my wells. Good. And those are basically hollow things on my gel that I'm going to put uh, my DNA into. I don't, it doesn't have to be my DNA. There's other things that can be separated. Uh, but there's big things that I'm going to separate. If I'm doing this with DNA, I'm going to make this end the positive end, and this end, the negative end. Why do I want to do that? What is it about my my structure? Yeah? Um, DNA is negatively charged, so it's sort of DNA is negatively charged, and so it's going to move kind of down here. Yeah. So um, I have, I, if my negative end here is, is here, my positive end is here, this DNA that is going to be put in here is negative, right? DNA has an overall negative charge. I won't go too deep into why that is, but it's partially because of the phosphate background. Um, and so we take advantage of that and we start to separate it. 
and I'm going to get some movement. And the movement's going to be downwards. Okay, so this is the direction. And in that case, which of these move the farthest? The ones on the top or the ones on the bottom? The ones at the bottom? Yeah, the ones on the bottom. So these ones move the farthest. And these ones move the least farthest. I'm not saying shortest because that's going to be confusing. Um, these move the farthest and these move the least farthest. But is that a right phrase? I don't even know. But um, what determines if they're able to move? Well, I'm in like a gel. And what do you think can move quickly through a gel? What can move quickly through a gel? I mean, if it's small, it's really fast. Very good. I bet you did well on your, your test this morning. Uh, so uh, these ones are going to be my small ones, which means these ones are going to be my large ones. It just separates things based on size. Okay? All of these want to move down because they're all negative all of the different strands here. But what this is going to show me is it's going to show me uh, which strands were able to go down. Now I'm going to show you one more thing. You, you will always see something like this in the first one. Or not always, but sometimes you see it. We call this the ladder. Like the rungs of a ladder. The reason we use this is because this, is, this contains genes of known lengths. Okay? And once we stop our gel, sometimes we're not really sure how far it's gone. It's kind of an imprecise science. But if we know how far these have gone, we can use it to compare the lengths of these. So if I know, say, this is, I don't know, 150 a base pair, then I know that this gene right here was 150 base pair. If, whereas if I kind of, it was a little bit condensed, sometimes you can't just tell right away. You have to compare it to something. That's why we have that little ladder. So there's a bunch of different uses for gel like recess. Number one, we can just kind of separate DNA to see if DNA is there. But the real use, and you probably know this, is to compare DNA, right? It's really, really common to compare DNA. So in this example, let's say I have my ladder here, and then I had my A, B, and C. And my A has this pattern, my B has this pattern, and my C has this pattern. Which two individuals are most closely related? B and A. Yeah, B and A, because they share the most genes here in common. Based on the information provided, those are the most closely related. So I've made my copies of my DNA. I ran it through a gel, and it all looks good. They, what I can often do then is say, hey, I'm going to go send it away to be sequenced. Uh, I don't know if Columbia has their own sequencing, but when I've done this with, with uh, Catherine Turner, we don't talk about it, but we send it out to a place in Long Island, and then they will send us back an email, or they'll send us back a, like a computer file that has a bunch of A's, G's, C's, and T's. Now, what's happening in the background is sequencing. So, um, in order to do this, I kind of, I will, what I'll do is I'll end up with all these different strands of DNA of different lengths. And then what I actually do, um, now the process behind that involves something called dideoxy uh, ribonucleic acids, which are just basically things that kind of stop along the way. That's why they're all those different lengths. And what I do is I'm going to want to put those into my wells. And I am going to want to kind of analyze those. So if everyone actually in your packet could go to the very last page, um, the, the, sorry, the page right before that, is going to show us a sequence of DNA. And that sequence is going to kind of be cut up by all these different things uh, called these dideoxyribonucleic acids. And it's going to give me different things. It's going to give me a bunch of different strands of different lengths. And I am going to then put those, if you go to the last page, into different wells. This well will be the A well, the C well, the G well, and the T well. And what I'm going to do is I'll actually run this on the gel, too. And what it will do is it will give me a sequence of DNA. And uh, this would have been unknown to me because this is all just kind of in a culture. Uh, but once I see this on here, it's going to, be going to go. Now, I wouldn't know this. But if uh, you go back a page, uh, you won't be able to see this. But the enzymes that, that do this are able to know this, like DNA uh, polymerase is, is able to just kind of know this um, based on itself. And it will present itself to us through sequencing. So 
on this page, we're just going to quickly uh, make the template or make the uh, uh, the corresponding strand to this. So if on one strand I have C T G A C T T C G A C A, then I'm going to pair that with. Hopefully you can go along with me. G A C. You can write this in T G A. Okay. Now, my enzyme would have done that, but it actually would have had different ones of kind of different lengths as we go along there. And then what I would want, I would plug all those kind of different ones. Um, some are going to stop every time I get to an A, or at different lengths every time I get to an A. Some will, some will stop when I get to a C, some will stop when I get to a G, and some will stop when I get to a T. And I'm able to kind of separate those here. Now, I wouldn't know this, but my enzyme would have kind of presented this to me. And here's how it would have presented it to me. I would have gotten all my results and I would have ran it on a gel. And the gel would have ended up looking like this. C would have been my first band. My next band would have been A, slightly lower than that. My next band would have been C. My next band would have been T. See how I'm doing this? Next I would have gotten G. Next I would have gotten A. And then another A. And then a G and then a C, T, G, T. This is actually what I would have seen. And then a little device would have read this. I'm going to show you a quick animation to show this, OK? They're going to give me things of different lengths. And I'm going to put them into different ones based on if they're A, C, G, or T. I'm going to run that. Sorry, just really quickly. So I'm going to kind of build off of this. This is my A1, but sometimes I get to an A that's dideoxy and then I can't build off of it anymore. So that's only a certain length. Now sometimes it'll get up a little bit longer than that. Based on where all my A's are, sometimes a little longer, sometimes shorter, based on whenever the dideoxyribonucleic acid shows up. Now I know this is seeming complicated, but it's basically just uh, whenever I kind of run into these roadblocks, which I kind of put in there intentionally, it's going to run out of those. And I do that for all of them. Okay? Then I run it on the gel. And the order doesn't matter, right? Um, the order does not matter, so long as I know where the A, the T, the G, and the C are. Okay? I'm going to run that. And then I'm going to put it on a, kind of an x-ray thing, and then these are going to show up. Now, often these are thousands long. And it used to be that an undergrad would just kind of read it, and then you would, or, or uh, an intern in a lab would read it, and you would do this. But now we have computers that can read this. And the computers will output something. Right? So that's very tedious to hold like a ruler up and to write it out. So we don't really do that anymore. 